Let's pray. God, we're thankful for your word that gives us a, a footing, a, a way to understand the world around us. And Lord, we pray this morning as we gather around the warm glow of your word that you would uh, penetrate our hearts. Father, we pray for our world, specifically this morning for Israel, that you might bring justice to wicked men who seek to do harm, that you might bring comfort and healing for the victims and their families, and that you might bring peace, true peace to a region of the world that is so often in conflict. And Lord, as we look at your word this morning, would you prick our hearts? Would you guide us to truth and would you change us? In your son's name we pray, amen. Well, last week we looked at the feeding of the 5,000 and how God uses ordinary people doing ordinary things to accomplish extraordinary things for His glory. And in our application, we looked at specific gifts, specific abilities, and specific opportunities that we might have, no matter how small, that God might use to bring His glory. And as Jesse mentioned, this week we offered up our extension cords, our hot dog grills, our shop lights, our crock pots, our face painting skills, and our time that God might use those things to bless our community, to bless our neighbors. Because we looked last week, God delegates ministry to us but we have to depend on Him to accomplish His will. And just as the disciples continually went back to Jesus in the feeding of the 5,000, our relationship to God is vital. That if we're going to make disciples, we have to be disciples. That there's a fundamental understanding of the Christian life. Uh, and, I, and, and we need to walk with the Lord that He might bear fruit through us. So this morning, we're going to take an excursion from, from our study of the book of Matthew into 1 Peter. And we're going to look a little deeper into the basic nature of our walk with Christ and our motive for ministry. You know, I love the fall, not just because of the weather, but I love sports. And so right now is this incredible convergence of, of college football and pro football and the major league playoffs. Uh, I'm not a big hockey fan, but the NHL is in preseason. Like this is that window of the year when everything is going on in the sporting world. So I have to watch myself not to make an idol and avoid my family. But, but one of the things that I've just noticed and appreciated over my life with sports is the commitment to the fundamentals. When we look at professional or world-class athletes, we realize they're not, they're not doing trick shots. They've mastered the fundamentals. You know, in, in basketball, it's, it's dribbling, it's passing, it's shooting, it's defense. In baseball, it's, it's hitting, it's fielding, it's throwing. That when you watch world-class athletes, it's not that they're magicians, it's that they've mastered fundamentals to an incredible scale. And if we think about the most important element of last week's miracle in the feeding of the five thousand it was the disciples and their understanding of who Jesus was it was their obedience and dependence on him it was this fundamental thing that they had mastered or, or that they were that they were mastering obviously they're they're going to make plenty of mistakes but it was it was a pretty basic simple idea and and really it's the same with us if we seek to minister to others if we seek to make disciples. God doesn't ask us to do trick shots. He doesn't ask us to be superhumans. He asks us to know Him, to obey Him, and to depend on Him. That this is part of the set of fundamentals that we have to master if we're going to be His disciples and we're going to make disciples. So this morning, what we're going to do in our passage in 1 Peter is we're going to look at a set of fundamental exhortations that Peter gives to us. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at verses 13 to 25. 
As many of you may know, Peter is writing from Rome to, a, to an audience that's mixed of Jews and Gentiles. He says those who reside as aliens, chosen sojourners, a diaspora, Jews that are living away from the homeland, and they're experiencing persecution, difficulties, hardship. Not a severe life-threatening persecution, that will come later, but, but a rejection of their worldview, a rejection of their social status. They're considered fools. They're subject to slander. They're being asked to compromise by the culture around them. They live in a world where the cultural Christianity is not the predominant worldview. Does it sound familiar? You know, in a lot of ways, First Peter is a, a very helpful book for us today as we live in a, in a culture that's moving farther away from a Christian worldview, moving farther away from Christ. And so we might think of 1 Peter almost as a manual for living in a hostile land. And after his greeting to this point in the, in the letter, Peter spent verses 3 to 9 explaining a mindset that, that, that a mindset focused on the eternal. That, that he's going to talk about the trials and the sufferings that you're enduring and how an eternal mindset looking at this eternal inheritance that God has given us is, is required and helps us through trials. And, and then in the, the, the immediate sentences leading up into the, to this in verses 10 to 12, Peter explains that the gospel message is not a new thing, but it's an explanation of the message that the prophets were delivering. It's not an audible it's not a change of plan. That, that this gospel that's come before you, that Jesus died for your sin and faith in Christ saves you, was, was talked about all the way back in the prophets. And then we come to chapters 13 to 25 where we're going to spend our time today. And, and we're going to see in this passage four imperatives, four commands that Peter gives for how we are to, to live out our faith. Peter says, basically, in order to live consistency with who you are in Christ, you need to fix your hope fully on God's grace. You need to be holy. You need to conduct yourself with fear. And you need to love one another fervently from the heart. So we're going to look at these four exhortations, these four commands, and see how they form a fundamental framework for our lives and our ministry. Look at verse 13. Peter says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's a statement. This is what we do. He's been talking about this imperishable, eternal inheritance that we have. And because you have that inheritance, therefore, fix your hope. Prepare your mind for action. Preparing isn't the command. It's, it's, it's telling us how we are to fix our hope. He says, preparing your mind for action, girding up your minds. You, you've probably heard this illustration before, but the image would have been clear to the first century readers that the idea of, of these flowing robes that they wore, that they're going to bind those up so they don't get in a way of movement. Tuck it into your belt. Be ready to run. Prepare yourself for activity. It's literally gird up the loins of your mind. That, that it's, it reminds us of Exodus 12 and the Passover. Preparing for the Passover, God tells the Israelites to be prepared. Have your belts sandal, I'm sorry, have your belts fastened. Have your sandals on your feet. It's, it's the idea that you're prepared, you're ready, even though it's difficult. We might say, roll up your shirt sleeves. And then he says, keep sober or being sober minded. It's the second way he describes this command. It's not the idea of avoiding intoxication. In the New Testament, it's the idea of, of being self-controlled, of being balanced, of exercising good judgment. In the midst of pressure, we can be crazy. I remember when I was in the Cub Scouts going to a day camp, and we were doing canoe in the French Broad River, 
which is like this deep. It's, I don't know why they call it a river, especially the area we were canoeing in. But, you know, in the, in the preparation to this canoe trip, they take you through all these safety measures. I mean, we might as well have been in a, in a high category whitewater raft the way they were, you know, you wear your helmet. If you fall in the water, you go feet first. And so as a kid in about third grade, I was scared. And, and me and my friend John were in this canoe and we start down and we're starting to get stuck and I'm starting to panic. And, and I look back on it now, there's no reason to be panicked, but I was panicked. And I remember John trying to calm me down and just being like, man, I, I don't get it. I, I'm scared. And his dad, who was the scout leader, had to switch canoes with him and sort of help me through this. But in that moment, it's, it's funny. It's like 45 years later, I still remember the irrational feeling of being out of control. The irrational feeling of, hey, stop that, didn't work. That his, his dad had to get in the canoe and of course he, he knocked us off the little bitty rock we were sitting on and, and we went on down. <laughs> but I think about that moment that we tend to be a people that when we are stressed out, we lash out. And so, Peter is giving this command, fix your hope on God's grace, but he tells us you do that by, by, by girding up, by being ready, by being prepared. That our minds are prepared for action and we're sober in spirit. The reality is when his dad got in the boat, I was fine because I knew he had control. And so that's the image that Peter gives these people, prepare your mind for action, be sober in spirit. And then we come to our first imperative. Fix your hope completely. This is our first exhortation. It's not a passive thing. Fix our hope completely on future grace. This isn't a blind optimism. We're not saying, hey, think happy thoughts. We're not talking about the power of positive thinking. We're thinking about looking forward to this thing that is true, the, the coming of Christ, the full realization of our salvation, that, that it's almost, you could say, a mindset that my hope is fixed completely on this future thing that's absolutely true. That we live according to the reality of what we believe. That's all he's asking us to do. Live according to the reality of what we believe. You believe Christ is coming. You believe that Christ is your salvation. Fix your eyes on that so that all these things that are happening around you are minor issues. You know, as we sit and we contemplate the pressures of life, when we only focus on the pressures of life, we have a tendency to, to, to be anxious, to, to want to escape, to let fear consume us. And we, we escape into things that we shouldn't escape into to try to relieve the pressure. But Peter says, fix your hope on the future. You know, we have six kids, and, and, and as I watched Antonia go through each of our six, our, our six children's pregnancies, she was sick from day one until delivery day. That, that with, with all of our kids, I think the most she gained over the pregnancy was five pounds, even though the babies were full, healthy, you know, upper eight, low nine pound babies but her body only gained about five pounds because she was so sick that she was hospitalized for a few of the pregnancies because of dehydration. She had to spend a lot of time in bed on bed rest. Uh, one of the pregnancies, she had a pump of, of Zofran in her leg just to keep her from throwing up continuously. She, the, with the latter pregnancy, she felt blood pressure and then just the general aches, pains, and discomforts. And I'm like, why? Why would you do that? And we all know the answer is because at the end of those 40 weeks, here's this child, that she was able to fix her eyes on this future thing to endure the hardship of what she was going through. I think in the military that some of our favorite, the most popular viral videos are, are soldiers coming home and the soldier coming home with the, the first reunion with his wife and his children. And you think about the hardship that he's in, or she has endured and the things that they've seen are things that most of us can't imagine. 
but you think about their perspective. They're doing it for their family. They're doing it for us in hope that one day they will return home to be with their family. And that's a hope that may or may not be realized. We have a hope that will be fully realized in the coming of Christ when our salvation is made complete. Fix your eyes on the hope, the fully on the grace that's brought to you. And we have to adjust our minds to the eternal. You know, my hope is often fixed on my next meal, my next vacation, my next ball game, my next time that life's going to be better. My hope can be fixed on the next election. My hope can be fixed on the next holiday break. And, and the problem is for most of us, because we live in a country that we're surrounded with, with relative wealth, that we have a lot of opportunities, oftentimes you and I can make it day by day and do relatively well by fixing our hope on the temporary. We can, we can sort of wing it and get by with it a lot of times, which is actually a, a drawback in many ways because, you know, if you think about it, disappointment is always the re result of, of misplaced hope, that we get disappointed when the things we're hoping for don't come true. But what are we going to fix our hope toward? We fix our hope completely on the grace that's brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, let's keep going as we look at the second imperative, his second exhortation. He says in verse 14, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. We have a new birth and imperishable inheritance. Jesus, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, J.C. Ryle in his collection of papers on holiness says, I have a deep conviction for many years that practical holiness and entire self-consecration to God are not sufficiently attended to by modern Christians. That we don't actually pursue holiness. He says... Christians in this country, politics or controversy or party spirit or worldliness have eaten out the heart of lively piety in too many of us. The subject of personal godliness has fallen sadly into the background. He wrote that in 1879. So what is holiness? Raul goes on to say, it's not knowledge. Balaam had knowledge. It's not great professions. Judas Iscariot had a great profession. It's not doing many things. Herod had that. It's not zeal for certain matters in religion. Jehu had that. It's not morality and outward respectability of conduct. The young ruler had that. He says it's not taking pleasure in hearing preachers. The Jews in Ezekiel's time had that. He said it's not keeping company with godly people. Joab, Gehazi, Damas had that. Yet none of these people were holy. A man can have any one of those things and not see the Lord. So what does Peter tell us about holiness? First, negatively, he explains, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance the way you formerly lived. Don't live according to those lusts. Don't go back to the desires that you had before you placed your faith in Christ. He says, as obedient children or children whose spirit is obedience. The, the default is obedience. As, as obedient children, indulgence, uh, Self-indulgence is a characteristic of those who are ignorant of God. That we are His children to be obedient. And, and His point is, don't conform to the old ways. While we're fixing our eyes completely on the Gospel, don't go back. So does this mean a true Christian 
can have desires and won't act on them. That's true. That our desires don't necessarily go away. This was a, this was a big mistake I made early in my faith was the idea that, man, because I still have desires or because I still struggle with sin, maybe my faith didn't take. Maybe I'm not really a Christian. But the fact Peter has to say to us not to do it lets us know that there's a tendency or a desire or a want to that's still in us that wants to do it. But he says, don't do it. Because look at how he describes the time. You're ignorant. This is a, this is a former way when you were in ignorance. You know better now. So what does it mean to be holy? The word holy means set apart, separated. Look at the standard Peter gives us. He says, be holy as I am holy. God is our standard of holiness. It's not our neighbor. It's not the most spiritual person we can think of. It's God. And really in the text, the idea is it's progressive. It's, it's, it's the idea of become holy. It's a process that we're going through. We might say that holiness is conforming our thinking and our behavior to God's character. That, we're, that our thoughts and our actions bend now towards God's character. In the Old Testament, we see the law operate by setting Israel apart from the nations. He gives them the law they're meant to be set apart from the nations. That if, if they're going to be a blessing to the nations, they have to be set apart. That, that God's ways are distinct from the world's ways. So we are to identify with Him as being set apart and that we relate to the world on God's terms. We don't relate to God on the world's terms. We relate to the world on God's terms, allowing Him to change us. Peter's saying that the readers need to be holy, that it's a call to live in an obedient relationship with God in a way that sets us apart from the customs and the values of an unbelieving culture. We're different. We don't live like we used to when we did whatever we felt like. Even when the world tells us it's okay, because there will be plenty of people out there that will say it's okay. A little compromise, a little change. You do you. Be true to yourself. That's not how we live. We live different. Now he's not saying be religious different. He's saying be conformed to God. He's exhorting us to sweeping change that we can't even imagine, to be honest. God's desire in the Old and the New Testament is to create a people who morally conform to God's character. Not that we're to be weird. It's not that, that we just pick the opposite of what people do so that we can be different, but that we're actually being conformed to who God is. That we're to be set apart in our relationship with God, and that's what makes us foreigners in this world. Later on, Peter's going to say in chapter 2, you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. It's not self-righteousness. It's not external moralism. You know, you and I, we can do pretty well in church. We've learned the parameters of acceptable social behavior. We, we know that certain things are okay and there's certain lines you don't cross. And, and it, as long as I can stay in the club of, of changing just enough on the outside to fit in, that, that we can compare ourselves to others and sometimes we can feel pretty good about ourselves. But that's not the standard Peter gives us here in this exhortation. Be holy because I am holy. Be holy yourselves in all your behavior. God's holiness is the standard. And guess what? When we live holy lives, there's actually practical fruit apart from honoring God. Paul, Paul uh, Peter tells us elsewhere that holiness is attractive. It's not my words that persuade. In chapter 2, he says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. 
In chapter 3, it's, it's not apologetics that P Peter encourages us to win over an unbelieving spouse. He says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some don't obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of your lives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Our holiness is a light to the world. We are to be a people set apart. This is a fundamental of our faith. The world around us is, they're, they're drinking sand. It's like, hey, come follow me in this immoral behavior and you'll be happy. And, and it's literally like there's a, there's a pitcher of sand that, that we understand they're drinking from. It leads to death. It leads to thirst. It doesn't help anything. But man, they are selling it. And on every corner. But you and I know different. Our lives are to be lived in such a way as to set us apart. Peter keeps going in verse 17. We see his third imperative, his third exhortation. He reminds us of our special relationship with God because of our new birth. He tells us that we have to remember who He is and to give Him the reverence He deserves. He says, if you address as the Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For He was foreknown before the foundation of the world has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through Him are believers in God who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. You saw the exhortation there, right? Conduct yourselves in fear. Fear is emphatic. He, 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 we could have translated this in fear. Conduct yourselves. So what is Peter talking about when he's talking about fear? There's two types of fear. The first type of fear that we think of is fright. Uh, it's, it's, and fright is always unhealthy. John 7, 13, out of fear the Jews spoke to no one openly of Him. That, that fright is that paralyzing thing. That's what I experienced in the canoe. Was a, was a paralyzing fear. That's not what Peter's talking about when he's talking about fearing the Lord. The fear that Peter is talking about is reverence. You know, in the Bible, we see reverence. Reverence pointing towards God. We see reverence pointing towards men. And, and one of the things you'll notice is when fear is directed at men, it usually isn't based on their character but it's based on their office. Peter describes this in 2.18 when he says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only the good and gentle, but the unjust. Why do you submit to him? Not because he's a good master, but because he's your master. That we're going to have reverence for the master because of his position. And so the issue with that is that we respect those with authority. But when fear in the Bible is directed towards God... It is based on His character. It is based on His righteousness. It is based on His holiness. So why do we fear Him? First, because of His character. Verse 17, He impartially judges. God is not a judge that can be bought. He's a judge that isn't influenced by person. It is only the facts. If you address the Father as one who impartially judges according to each one's work. So we fear Him first of all because of His character. And then second, Peter says, we, we fear Him because of doctrine. Specifically, redemption. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. We know that we were redeemed. So this knowledge, it's a linking verb that, a linking verb that connects the command for respect to 
the doctrine of redemption. Knowledge is always the foundation of our conduct. We live out what we know. In, in Romans 5, Paul says, uh, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. The knowledge of suffering produces endurance helps us to endure. James 1, count it joy when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfast. You can endure because you know something. And so in this way, we fear God because we know about the redemption. We understand our redemption. Then in the first century, you had slaves that would work to purchase their freedom. They would, they would do side hustles to save money, ultimately to pay off their servitude. And they would collect this redemption. The word is, is lutron. They would collect this money to purchase their lutron. Verse 18, knowing you were not lutron with perishable things. Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man did not come to be, to be, to be served, but to serve and give Himself a lutron for many. That, that the idea is redemption. And Peter's audience would have understood this redemption. In the Old Testament, we see money redemption like in Leviticus 25 with the, with the, uh, the purchase of a nearest kinsman's land, uh, that there was a redemption that was paid to provide for the survivor. But God also redeems without money in the Old Testament. Exodus 12 he redeems through the blood of the Passover lamb. Isaiah 52, 3 says, you will be redeemed without money. And so what is this redemption that we've received? What is this purchase that Jesus did? What is our, our redemption? Well, well, our redemption in Christ is not perishable. It's infinitely valuable. It's perfect. It's unblemished. It purchased us from sin and provides us with salvation. And the question is, what are we redeemed from? Again, it's, it's these feudal ways inherited from our fathers. It's tradition. It's aimless. It's powerless. It's useless. But Jesus purchased our freedom from sin. He purchased us from the penalty of sin with His blood. That we rever Him, we, we, um, we fear Him because of who He is, but we also fear Him and, and respect Him because what He's done for us. You and I were destined for death, but He purchased us. We owe Him our reverence. All we have to do is place our faith in Christ and our sin is totally dealt with because He paid the price. And, and he, like I said earlier, this isn't a plan B. This was God's eternal plan. It was foreknown before the foundation of the world. But it says it appears in the last times for your sake. You and I have a fuller understanding than Abraham had, than Moses had, than David have had. That we understand the redemption, the price that Jesus paid. We understand it fully. And that, if we really grasp the reality of that, we would have no choice but to be in awe. We have no choice to be blown away every second that He did that for us. That we should be walking around constantly, joyously, appreciative, and in awe that the God of the universe who is holy and righteous and just and worthy of our fear, also redeemed us so that our fear, our awe, our wonder is a response to that. So, so our attitude towards God is both reverential and confident because He's able to do this. So to this point, we're, we're looking at, at what's true of us. And we're looking at our expectation that we live in reverence of who God is, that we conduct ourselves in fear, thankful for what He's done, but also 
understanding who he is. And that leads us into our fourth exhortation. In verse 22, he said, Since you have obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the Word we preach to you. In light of our, the work that God has done through us, in light of the Gospel, we have a pure life that's free from the stain of sin. He paid it all. We are white as snow. He has redeemed us. And, and this is the doctrine of justification that He imputed righteousness to us. We are righteous because of all that Christ did. Positionally, we are clean. We can't get any cleaner. That God sees us in Christ as if we have never sinned because Christ's righteousness is placed over us. So our souls are purified in that sense. But, but there's also going on here in the text the idea of sanctification, that the process of how He conforms us, the process of, of God making us holy. Remember the, the progressive idea of becoming holy, that we're to, to be holy. So there's this ongoing growth that's taking place in our lives as God conforms us and changes us and shapes us. And, and the result of this, the result of our justification, the result of our ongoing sanctification is that we have a pure inner life, that we have love that's unhypocritical, unhypocritical, that we have a sincere love for the brethren. Our love is both because of Him and it shares the essence of His love for us. That He caused us to be loving. He is changing us and making us loving. But that love is in essence the same love that He shows for us. We're not talking about a conditional type love here. We're not even talking about a romantic love here. We're talking about an unconditional love that delights in what's best for others. A true benevolence that it's selfless. It's focused on other people. You know, we live in a culture that tells us to love ourselves, to, to maintain good self-care, to avoid negative things, that basically selfishness is okay. And this is nothing new. From the beginning, we tried to do it our own way. We saw this attempt at unity back in Genesis 11. Remember the Tower of Babel? We see an attempt at unity in the end in Revelation 17 and 18 with Babylon the Great. But our human attempts, man's attempts at unity never work. Warren Wiersbe said, if we try to build unity in the church on the basis of our first birth, we fail. But if we build unity on the basis of a new birth, then it will succeed. Peter says, from a pure heart, the stress lies on the inwardness of the love. Paul says in Philippians 2, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own needs, but also the interest of others. And then Peter says, fervently, earnestly. It's, it's, it's the idea of to stretch that the, the fervency he's talking about here isn't, it, it's, it's, it's not talking about the amount of love. It's talking about the duration of love. This is a, this is a tenacious, lifelong commitment to, commit, to, to consider others more important than myself. That I'm fervently going to love you guys. That you fervently are going to love one another. In verse 1 to 3, Peter, back, back in chapter 1 in the, in the third verse. It says He caused us to be born again to a living hope. In, in chapter 1, verse 3, Peter shows that our new birth is the starting point for the blessings that we receive. That because of this new birth, you've been blessed with all these spiritual blessings. Because of this new birth, 
He has given you everything. So this new birth is the foundation for all the blessings we'll receive. But right here in this verse, verse 23, the new birth is also the starting points for the blessings that we give out. That because I have a new birth, I receive a lot. But also because of a new birth, I'm meant to love others. It's what I was made to do. It's the outworking of what I was made to do. So obedience to the truth actually produces a sincere love for my brothers and sisters. He says, how? What's, what's our motivation? It's the living and perishable Word of God. All flesh is like grass. It's glory like the flower of grass. The grass, grass withers, the flower falls off, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. Again, there are so many books if we went to Barnes & Noble and just had all the books on how to have a successful life. That's not going to help. Those are temporary. The Word of God is an anchor for us. These things I'm sharing with you, these exhortations, they're not ideas that I made up or some guru handed me that we hope might work. This is life. This is life as it was designed by the designer. Our, our lives should we be marked by a sincere desire to see the best for others. We always should look for ways to actively consider others more important than ourselves. We should look different as Christians. We should look different from our culture that tells us to look out for ourselves because we do the opposite. And so we look around and we say, who around us needs help? It's, it's so similar to the disciples last week. Who around us needs help? What do I have that I can give to others? How do I live an others-focused life? Do I have physical skills that benefit someone? Are there acts of service that I can actually do? Is it counsel that I can offer? Is it, is it money? Is it time? Is it resources? Is it this very message, the gospel, that we deliver to the world around us, that Jesus died for your sin, place your faith in Him, and join the family? This is how we live as His disciples. And this is how we minister as disciples. So Peter has given us four exhortations. And this is an exhaustive list of, this isn't all the fundamentals of the Christian life. But Peter gives us four fundamentals that help us understand. Fix your hope fully on God's grace. Be holy. Conduct yourselves in fear. And love one another fervently from the heart. And so I want to challenge each of you this week to, to find a closet, to find a time, to find a little interrupted time, to spend, week, spend some time asking how you're doing in these things. Are these areas that that you blow off? Do I take my eyes off God's grace and put them on what i got to do this week? Or the comfort that I'm hoping will temporarily ease the pain? Am I being holy or am I like everyone else and I'm just kind of doing my best and giving it the old college try? Am I considering all that God did? Am I considering who He is and am I considering the redemption that He has purchased for me? And am I living in fear of Him? And am I loving others fervently from the heart? Is my hope actually fixed on God's grace in the eternal rather than temporal things? Am I pursuing holiness? Ask yourself those things. Take this seriously. This is fundamental. You can't play basketball if you don't learn to dribble. We can't walk as Christians without doing the fundamental things that God asks us to do. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for Your Word and we look at the world around us and, and recognize that there are needs everywhere. And, and as the disciples in the feeding of the 5,000, we are prone to look at just the natural world and try to solve the problem through natural means. But Lord, you call us to live in relationship with you. And so this text helps us understand both how to live in relationship with you and how to minister to others. 
So would you use it to change our hearts? In your son's name, amen.